Greetings and welcome to A Journey Through Aesthetic Realms. Today we present the second of a three-part series on Sri Haidakan Babaji, featuring an interview with Ms. Marge De Vivo, who is one of Babaji's trusted disciples from the United States. Last week we heard the story of how a young yogi who was discovered in a cave in Haidakan, India in 1970 was believed to be the legendary Haidakan Babaji, who lived in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Mr. Vivo also shared how she first came into contact with him at his Haidakand ashram in India. Today we'll continue our interview with Mr. Vivo about her encounter with the legendary saint who is regarded by many as the immortal Mahavata Babaji, who is described in Yogananda's Autobiography of a Yogi. It was a constant checking within in alignment, or am I not? And he always gave an indication really quickly of when you were in alignment. He always gave some sort of blessing or something or gave you a piece of fruit or just smiled. There was an immediate acknowledgement anytime you were in alignment. But if you were ever going to him in expectation, you didn't get anything. He didn't even look at you if you were not right in the zone, right on the beam at that moment. So it was a great way to know when you're in alignment, when you're not, knowing that your inner atmosphere is the most important thing around him at every given moment. Before I went, I knew that his teachings were truth, simplicity, and love, and unity of all religions. And then in, in Harakon, you'd live that, because there's people from every country in the world all visiting there, and you might all speak a different language most of the time, but then when you went into the temple, you all sang in Sanskrit, and you all sang the names of God. Previously, Ms. DeVivo shared with us that so many people wish to stay in Babaji's presence, largely because of the unconditional love which they felt from him. Babaji had said, Whosoever comes to me with love, then I will show him or her love without anything imaginable. There was so much unconditional love coming out of him, even though he knew all my past, all my future. That was mind-boggling. I mean, truly mind-boggling. And to actually feel unconditional love from any being is something I don't think you get over. You knew that he knew if you weren't doing what you said you would do, or if you weren't treating someone else in the ashram exactly, very nicely, you knew that he knew all of it and he would often just burst into rooms. It was an omnipresent, omniscient type of experience where you just knew, okay, the jig's up. There's no fake anything. It, he knows me from my core. Who else can you run into who will make you really, truly be accountable to yourself? And that was, that was one of the greatest blessings of being there. Illustrating Babaji's deep knowing is the following experience shared with Ms. DeVivo and others by a devotee named Dan Boulay. In kindergarten I was taught to squeeze to the left side of my chair in order to make room for my guardian angel to sit. Deeply impressed, I took these instructions very seriously. I remember consciously and obediently forming the secret habit of leaving space beside me for what the nuns and priests told me was God's heavenly messenger and special protector, my personally assigned guide and helper. I don't know when I left that ritual behind or when that delightful childhood game faded away, but I remember exactly when the memory of it was awakened. It was in August 1980. It was my second day in Haidekan. I was sitting in the shade on a stone ledge, leaning back against a wall. A woman who told me that she had been Babaji's disciple for eight lifetimes was screaming at me as if I had just committed a mortal sin. She was threatening me with a stick. Do you know where you are sitting? That's Babaji's room behind you. You can't sit there. A moment later, Babaji came whirling around the corner of the building. 
she began to prostrate herself and attempted to kiss his feet. But he walked right past her and snuggled up alongside me on the seat. He curled up like a cute little boy. His eyes sparkled. He giggled like a child in church. The moment exploded in a gentle burst of white light. And I was back at that kindergarten desk. I was looking into the loving eyes of my guardian angel. Everything stopped. He was, in that moment, the most beautiful man I had ever known. There are many fascinating reports about Babaji's supernatural powers. In September 1970, Babaji ascended Mount Kailash in Tibet and sat on the summit absolutely motionless and without food, sleep or leaving his seat for 45 days. Chandramani, the devotee who first found Babaji in the cave in Haidekhand, went together with the great saint to Mount Kailash and reported later, All this time I was with him, but not once did I see him get up for anything, not even to have his bath. All this time he remained sitting at one spot, absolutely motionless. When he finally came out from his deep meditation, I asked him how he would have his bath since I could not see water anywhere. He answered me, I order the wind to fetch me water and that is what I bathe with. Then I noticed that his lovely long tresses were dripping with water. Chandramani also recounted that not only did Babaji not eat for long periods of time, but that also he himself didn't feel hungry while staying with him. However, once when Chandramani was very thirsty, Babaji let water and milk spring forth from a Shiva Lingam, a stone symbolizing Lord Shiva. It has also been observed that at times Babaji's feet left no footprints, that his clothes didn't get soiled when he was walking in mud, and that he was light as a feather when carried by someone else. He was seen appearing in different places at the same time, and a lion and a cobra who came near him behaved as though they were household animal companions. Babaji was also said to have the ability to miraculously multiply food. The kitchen workers in his ashram experienced that there was always enough food for visitors. Even when suddenly a bus with 100 visitors came and they had only prepared food for 20 people. Yet another fascinating ability of Haida Khan Babaji was that he could speak many languages without any accent. Every time we were away from Babaji, we'd say, gosh, we have to ask him all these questions. And then we'd get in his presence and there were no questions. The mind was just blank, you know, everything's fine. No questions, no problem, was nothing. I finally wrote down all the questions and said, okay, this is it. We've got to ask him all these things. So we took that list, went back to the ashram, to the temple where Babaji was for this whole celebration. So I'm reading the questions and he was answering in Hindi if there were Indian translators around, he'd use them, but if he was with you alone, he would speak your language completely, and not even with an accent. He would speak exactly the way that you would talk, actually. Babaji said of himself, I am nobody and nothing. This body has no meaning. I am only a mirror in which you can perceive yourself. It was so intense and so many things happening at once. It's after you got home that you could really look at things and say, okay, here's what he was showing me. And he was always reflecting back to you the way that you are. You know, the mirror is what we talk about a lot. I'm sure that's with every great spiritual teacher, their mirror. Ms. DeVivo recalls that for a while she had a hard time getting along with another disciple at the ashram. Silently aware of this, Babaji set about to heal their relationship in a subtle way by gifting Ms. DeVivo a beautiful mala or a string of beads used for meditation which had originally been offered to him. It was afterwards that I found out 
that the man who gave him the rose quartz beads was the one who I was having the fight with. And he was actually a jeweler. And he had gifted Babaji with those beads. And Babaji just automatically gave them to me. Then, after that experience, every time I saw this man, all we talked about was the beads, which was perfect. He hardly kept anything for himself. Everybody wanted to bring gifts, and he would just say, office, you know, kitchen, da-da-da-da. He was passing things out, or even if he wore a shirt once, then he passed it to someone else. Constant movement of energy and never hung on to anything at all for himself. Babaji lived a life of utmost simplicity. Even during winter he would bathe at four in the morning in the cold Gautama Ganga River and remain there for an hour. In the early years he had no room for himself and later he had but a tiny room. He ate sparingly. Sri Haidakam Babaji clearly had come to earth not to receive. He had said, I have come to give, only to give. Are you ready to receive? I give everything, but few ask for what I have really come to give. While using his physical vehicle, Babaji took on the bad karma of others to relieve them of their suffering. And he was always taking on karma. Const, uh, you know, and I mean in Harakon he was just glowing with so much energy and by the time we went to Vrindavan and there were the hundreds of people from morning till night, he just looked like he was in agony. This was just one of many ways that Babaji was assisting humankind with his vast spiritual abilities. It really looked like it was very, very difficult for a being like him to come into a physical body and function in a way that didn't blow somebody off the planet because he could do that. It's really important that he tones it way down. He gives you only as much as you can handle and maybe just a little bit more than that. In describing his great power, Babaji likened himself to fire. He said, I am like fire. Don't stay too far away or you will not get the warmth. But don't get too near or you may burn yourself. Learn the right distance. Babaji had appeared in 1970 and remained in his physical form for 14 years until 1984 when he stopped his heart. He had mentioned many times to his devotees that he was going to leave. Thank you, Elevated viewers, for your company today. Please join us again next Sunday, October 31st, for the third and final part of our interview with Ms. Marge De Vivo in getting to know more about Sri Haidakant Babaji. Be sure to tune in as Supreme Master Ching Hai shares her insights about Babaji, the wondrous immortal saint. Now, please stay tuned to Supreme Master Television for our noble lineage, right after noteworthy news. May heaven's love and light guide you always. To find out more about Babaji and his message, please visit www.babaji.net, www.babajispeaks.com and www.vishwagifts.com. For more details, please visit www.suprememastertv.com forward slash AJAR 